This is Books of Titans, the podcast dedicated to the influences of influencers. The books that have helped shape prominent inventors, business leaders, athletes, intellectuals, scientists, and others. We'll talk about what makes these books such classics and at least attempt to have an intelligent discussion about what makes them so important and influential. Hello, this is Eric Rostad coming to you from Franklin, Tennessee. Today I'm going to cover The Highlander's Last Song by George MacDonald. This is book 17 of 52 for my 2020 reading list. This novel is set in the time of the Scottish Highland clearances. And if you're unfamiliar with this time, it it lasted roughly from the 1750s to the 1850s uh, or 1860s. So about 100 years. And what was happening is that uh, mostly... People from England were coming to the north of Scotland, the the Scottish Highlands, and they were buying large swaths of land. And then they were turning this land into hunting ground. But there was a slight problem, and that was that Highlanders lived on this land, and they had lived on this land for hundreds of years. But they got in the way of the enjoyment of the Englishmen wanting to hunt the land. So the Englishmen would clear out the Highlanders. And so that's why they're called the clearances. And this led to deaths uh, as, as people were uprooted from their, their land. Uh, it also led to a lot of moving to other countries. So a lot of the, a lot of the Scots, uh, a, lot, a lot of the Highlanders at this time moved to Canada and the U- USA, and then uh, also to, to Ireland. So it's, it's a terrible and sad part of Scotland's history uh, but, and, but this novel takes place during that time. It's a story about a Highland chief named Alistair who is running up against modernity. So he's the chief, he's in charge of this, of this area of, of the Highlands. And part of his land has, has been sold to an English family who is set on turning it into a hunting ground. It's a book of contrast. You have these Highlanders versus the city people. You have sophisticated people, or at least they think so, the, the, London, the Londonites versus savages, uh, the Highlanders. You have religious ideas contrasted and the ramifications of those different ways of, of viewing uh, religious ideas and Christian ideas. This book is written in a heavily Presbyterian country. And McDonald confronted a lot of the key foundational tenets of Presbyterianism, so it's it's interesting to read to read it from that point of view as well. The author George McDonald he loved the Highlands, he loved the people of the Highlands, and he is my wife's favorite author. So I, I try to read one book a year by McDonald, and we actually named our second daughter Lilia after one of George McDonald's daughters. So he's had a profound impact on my wife. Uh, George MacDonald has had a profound impact on my favorite author, C.S. Lewis. Lewis called him his master, and Tolkien loved him. George MacDonald was a mentor to Lewis Carroll, who wrote Alice in Wonderland. And you just you, you look up George MacDonald and you see all the authors that he influenced, uh, Neil Gaiman, uh, just a ton of different people. It's really amazing. And it's amazing that he's not more well-known or, or more... Uh, read more by by people today. You, you don't hear as much about him as a C.S. Lewis or a Tolkien. Uh, and so I, I want to get to know George MacDonald more. Uh, with him being my wife's favorite author, with him impacting my favorite author, I want to read one of his books each year. And so I started last year reading Fantasties, and it's a fantasy book, and I, I'm not into fantasy, so I really didn't like it. But this one is, is more... It, it, real people, not uh, fairyland. Um, and so I, I enjoyed this one a lot more, The Highlander's Last Song. This is a different kind of book, and I don't really know how, how to fully explain it other than that it is, it's otherworldly. Uh, I wanted to be the protagonist. I wanted to be the main character. It caused me to look at things in a new way, to look at ideas and thoughts, and, and I'll, I'll highlight some of those in the next 
segment. It made me want to be a better man, a better husband, a better father, a better lover of God. It's just one of those books, like you know, a lot of a lot of novels. You, you don't necessarily want to be like the main character. You might like some things about the main character or some of the other characters, but but foibles and all, I wanted to be like the main character in this book. And so in that sense, it's, it's almost better than a nonfiction book of, you know, this is the right way to live, or this is, this is a good way to, to live. It's, it's almost better than that because you're actually seeing a, a character confront different problems and issues and life and death situations. And in seeing how he responds is amazing in the way McDonald writes is just, it's masterful. So C.S. Lewis said that Fantasties, the, the fantasy book, baptized his conscience, and that was part of his path to faith. I would say that this, bo- this book baptized my soul. It's just one of those where it just, I, it, just it simplifies things. It, it, uh, it, 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 it's hard to explain, but it, 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 it's an amazing book in a, in a different kind of book. As for who should read this book, uh, I would say if if you're a Christian, I, w- I would read this before a lot of the Christian living books or Christian nonfiction out there. Uh, like I said, it's just one of those where it 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 allows you to see faith in action and to see a person deal with things in a in a unique way and a loving way and a strong way in a in a right way. Uh, I would also say for who this book is for, if you like C.S. Lewis or you like Tolkien, you will see McDonald's influence in their writing as you read books by George McDonald. So that that's actually really fun just to see, oh yeah, I remember Lewis writing about this. Or I remember uh, I remember this being a part of Tolkien. Uh, and, and so to kind of get a, a, a eye on on where, how they were influenced is, is really cool. So as for who suggested the book, my wife did. She actually wanted me to read a different different one by McDonald this year. I'll probably read that one uh, next year or the year after. Uh, and so I, I don't recall why I chose this particular one, um, but I'm glad I did. It, it really, I, I loved it. It took me 10 hours and 45 minutes to read. That was over seven days. And it's, it's, uh, it's, it's a lot. I mean, each page was, it took a while. Uh, and then I, I underlined a lot. I took a lot of notes, uh, but it was a very enjoyable seven days of, of reading this book. So the rest of this episode, I'm going to, in, in, in the next segment, I'll cover some quotes and then some ideas that, that, uh, stuck out to me. And then in segment three, I will conclude with the one thing, my one key takeaway from this book. Now into segment two and, and some quotes and ideas that stuck out to me. So I'm just going to read some quotes and uh, maybe offer a, a few thoughts on, on some of them. The first, the secret of happiness is not in doing what one likes, but in liking what one has to do. I thought of, uh, end quote, I thought of uh, the book Range in this. And, and in Range he, by David Epstein, I uh, covered in, in the previous episode, he talks about the. it's not as necessarily important to take the perfect job or to wait for the perfect job, but to take some sort of a job and to see what you like and don't like about that. And so when I read this quote, it it, it made me think of that. And the secret of happiness is not in doing what one likes. So not, not waiting for that perfect job that you think is going to come along, but in liking what one has to do. So just doing something and finding the things you like about those different things. And that, that will actually lead you to the path of what you really enjoy doing. But if you're just waiting to, to discover it as opposed to, to doing and then seeing what you like. Um, but I, I just liked that. And, and I like when anybody ever says, what the, what's the secret of happiness? And, and uh, the way he puts it here, I thought was, was, was very good because you could, you could, in, in, in one sense, then you have, you have a certain level of control over that. Uh, you could like cleaning the floors um, you could learn to like cleaning the floors, where in, instead of viewing that as as utter mit- misery, uh, in, if you can, if you like what you do, what one has to do, that is the secret of happiness. Next quote: "The higher the calling, the more contemptible the man who pursues his own ends in it. The higher the calling, the more contemptible the man who pursues his own ends in it." 
end quote. That's uh, pretty self-explanatory. Next one. As by law is the knowledge of sin, so by love is selfishness rampantly roused. To be at last, like death, swallowed up in victory, the victory of the ideal self that dwells in God. End quote. That one's long. Let me, let me read that one again. As by law is the knowledge of sin, so by love is selfishness rampantly roused. To be at last, like death, swallowed up in victory, the victory of the ideal self that dwells in God. End quote. So as by law is the knowledge of sin, that comes from the Bible, he, con- he contrasts that with, so by love is selfishness rampantly roused, to be at last like death swallowed up in victory. So the, the goal of love is that selfishness is killed, that selfishness is swallowed up in victory, the victory of the ideal self that dwells in God, and that ideal self is not going to be selfish, is not going to be concerned first with with oneself um just the, the way he put that and contrasted it was was amazing and something I, i've i've been thinking about lately especially the last couple of years is just selfishness in general uh I, I i mean i i notice it every hour of every day uh especially in marriage and in parenting uh i want to i want to take care of myself first before my wife and my kids and but that's not who I want to be and I turned 40 this year have you seen 80 year olds who are still unbelievably selfish uh, a few come to to my mind and it is the it is the most it's one of the worst things that you can that you can see to see an 80 year old just completely full of themselves and to some degree you're th- you, you you look at, at these people and you think you're 80, you, by now you should you should know that that's not the goal that that's not the purpose of life to just be all about yourself uh, it's to it's to be about others and so it's just kind of hit me strong especially this year of what direction am I going to go am I going to go towards the direction of selfishness where I always come first before others and because I've seen where that leads and another 40 years from now if 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 that's the road if that's the way my individual decisions are are going I don't want to be that person at 80 years old I do want to be the person who is thinking of others and that that made me think of that in this quote of the the ideal self that dwells in God the ideal self is where selfishness is going to be swallowed up in victory like death and that is brought about by love. So what what direction am I going there? Um, next quote, complaint against God is far nearer to God than indifference about him, end quote. I, I like this one. Um, for, for a period, I was, I was in a church where you just, you, you kind of got the feeling that you, you shouldn't ask questions. You, you should just, just go with the flow. Just, this is how it is. Just accept it. And you you know you you might be having some problems with your faith if you're if you're having questions. But I found questions to be the the most important part of faith and the way that you grow. And as part of those questions, and, and you see that you know, book one of, of my list this year was the Bible, and in the Psalms, especially, you see a man crying out to God. You see complaints against God, and McDonald saying here complaints against God. A complaint against God is far nearer to God than indifference about him. And uh, to me, that's an, an encouraging, encouraging quote. Final quote I want to highlight here. Belief that is not lived is no belief at all. For belief involves what we do more than it does ideas. Again, belief that is not lived is no belief at all. For belief involves what we do more than, than it does ideas. End quote. So let's get to ideas. Uh, one of the, as I mentioned in segment one, there are a lot of contrasts in this book. So the contrast of of new versus old landowners, uh, poor versus rich, savage, savages versus versus the sophisticated, and this made me think of of a couple books. One is is Genes, Climate, and Consumption Culture by Dr. Jagdish Sheth. And that was on my 2018 reading list. And he went into a lot of, of how different houses from way back in time were made and how amazing they, those 
abodes were based upon the climate of those people. And so if it was a super hot climate, they, they made houses where air was flowing through and, and, uh, it, it, it was perfect for that climate. If it was a cold climate, they made, they made houses where, you know, and obviously out of necessity, but they, they just did really unique things that we may look in our technologically modern times and think, oh my gosh, these people are so backward and, 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 you know, look at, look at the simplicity, they're savages. Uh, but they really were very intelligent in, in a lot of, a lot of ways that they, that they lived. Um, and then this also came up in Brave New World. If, if you recall that book, the, these people living in the new London, they, they go to America to go to these savage areas. It's like, it's like a theme park, but you see how savages lived. Um, but these savages still have ideas of like marriage and, uh, like traditional beliefs. Whereas like they've in, in new London, they've gotten rid of all that in the brave new world. Uh, and, and just this idea that it, it's, it's not really wise to call them savages. And, and if, if you're coming at it from that angle of, you know, we're sophisticated and these are savages, you, you're never going to, you're never going to seek to, to learn from them or, or see how they, they did things. You're just going to think they're, they're stupid. And so that comes up a lot in this book, that, that contrast of the sophisticated Londonites versus the savage Highlanders. Uh, another idea is that of, of rights. So the question is posed, would you die for your rights? Would you die to keep your rights? And a lot of people have. Or would you die for truth? So would you die to protect your rights or would you die for truth? It's a, just a good question to, to leave, leave up there. Um, another contrast is rights versus possessions. And the, this, uh, this quote was, was amazing. Yet the love of possessing a property must, if goes unchecked, in time annihilate in a man the inheritance of the meek. Again, yet the love of possessing a property must, if, if it goes unchecked, in time annihilate a man in a man the inheritance of the meek. And I just love this because, again, book one of this year, uh, the Bible. So this, this, this links to, a, 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 to the Sermon in the Mount. Where, where Jesus says, the meek shall inherit the earth. So in this quote by MacDonald, it, in time annihilate in a man the inheritance of the meek. So the, what is the inheritance of the meek? It, the, the inheritance of the meek is the earth. And so uh, yet that's contrasted. If, if, you love, if your love of possessing a property now goes unchecked, it will annihilate the inheritance of the earth. So it will annihilate the very thing that you're you're wanting. So the love of possessing a property, the love of possessing the wrong thing, if going unchecked, will annihilate the inheritance of the earth, the inheritance of the meek. Just an amazing way that he put that and how it ties to the Sermon on the Mount. I mean, I, that, that just blew me away. I loved it. The next idea to, that stuck stuck out to me was I mentioned in segment one uh, with McDonald confronting Presbyterianism head on. I want to read a few quotes here from from a couple of different pages. This is Alistair's brother speaking to their mother about faith, and so uh, here here it goes. This is the mother starting. Oh, Ian, and yet you will not give Christ the glory of satisfying divine justice by his suffering for your sins. And then this is, this is Ian speaking. Mother, to say that the justice of God is satisfied with suffering is a piece of the darkness of hell. God is willing to suffer and ready to inflict suffering to save from sin, but no suffering is satisfaction to him or his justice. Then this is the mother speaking again. What do you mean by his justice then? And Ian replies that he gives you and me and everybody fair play. Later on, Ian says, I do not. Nothing can satisfy the justice of God but absolute fair play. The justice of God is the love of what is right and the doing of what is right. Eternal misery in the name of justice could satisfy none but a demon whose bad laws had been broken. And then later on, it satisfied love to suffer for another, but it does not satisfy justice that the innocent should be punished for the guilty. These are... uh, really strong words against uh, some of the key 
key tenets of Presbyterianism and uh, just amazing uh, that how McDonald confronts it, but with a, a conversation between the brother and the mother. The final idea in this book, it just comes up over and over, is the simplification of things. You know, what are what are the big ideas that we need to be thinking of? Uh, the secret of happiness, the c- contentment in, in work. Uh, who do you want to be? Belief. Big ideas, but the way that, that Alistair lives them out is is amazing and it's it it's simple and it, it just kind of gets through a lot of the clutter and mcdonald has this amazing ability to, to just get to the get to the heart of the matter now on to segment three and the one thing and here's my one thing our dependence is our eternity our dependence is our eternity Let me expand that a bit. It comes from this quote. Be independent, cries the world. But the Lord says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Our dependence is our eternity. End quote. I just thought that was an amazing contrast. So be independent, cries the world. So don't be dependent upon anything. But... McDonald here says our dependence is our eternity. The things that we depend on are our eternity. And he says, but the Lord says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. So the world says be independent. The Lord says be dependent upon the kingdom of God. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And so this 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 idea of dependence and, and that leading to eternity. Uh, do you remember last year in, in the episode I did on mere Christianity? I, I highlighted my one thing was this idea of that that C.S. Lewis puts forth that every decision we make is leading us towards uh, one way or the other, and and towards towards a heavenly realm or a, a, a hellish realm, and every every we, we have that decision in front of us. All day long with with the different things that we that we decide, and so uh, you see that I've I've seen that in a, a ton of the other books that I've read for this project as well. And, and most most of the time it's it's framed in daily habits. So what actions are you taking on a daily basis, and are those leading towards the person you want to be or to, towards a person you don't want to be? You you actually have a choice. It's not like some things aren't just going to magically happen 10 years from now. Uh, it's the decisions you're making right now that are leading towards that. Like health is not, you just don't become healthy by, by hoping you're, you're healthy. It's, it's, it's doing things on a daily basis is every time you choose to eat a healthy snack versus a, a, a unhealthy one. And yeah, that can, that can get, that can get annoying to, to be thinking about it uh, on that daily of a level, but there's something to it. And so with daily habits, th- I, this quote just made me think of it in a more expansive view of dependence. What what do you depend on? And what if you take that out further and view that as that is going to be your eternity? It's an interesting way to think about it, isn't it? Our dependence is our eternity. That's the thing that I've I've been thinking about since finishing this book. And it's my one thing from this book, the one thing I always hope to to remember. So to recap, this was a beautiful book. It was one where I I had a it sounds cheesy, but just I had a good feeling when when reading it. I, I wanted to be like the character. I wanted to I wanted to move in that direction of how they viewed life and how I can make things so complex a lot of the times, but just the simplicity here, uh, setting your face towards a direction and moving forward that and having, having everything in your life align with that. It's, it's beautiful in that sense. Uh, if you are a lover of C.S. Lewis, of Tolkien's work, I, I think you will enjoy McDonald. I, I liked this book. He has, he has plenty of others. If you're into fantasy, he has some fantasy books. Uh, but 
very very good book. This this was uh, one that that really surprised me, and I, I can't wait to read more McDonald in the future. All right, that's going to do it for this episode. Thank you for listening. I'd love to hear from you. You can email me at eric at booksoftitans.com. That's Eric with a K, so E-R-I-K at booksoftitans.com. Let me know what you thought uh, of this book, if you've read it, um, or if you've read other books that I've read for this project. One of the reasons I started this was to to be in touch with other people about the books that they're reading. Uh, you can follow Books of Titans on Instagram or Twitter. Uh, if you want to support the podcast, I have a support page. You just go to booksoftitans.com forward slash support. And I have a link to where you can buy books. And then any book you buy, I'll get a, a little piece of that. Or I just have a, do- a straight up donation form as well. Uh, the website is also stock full of resources to help you find books, create a reading list, and to see what other people are reading. I'll be back in a couple weeks discussing another book from my 2020 reading list. Until then, keep reading, keep learning, and keep listening. I'm out.